the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies and show you how they were made. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at From Dusk Till Dawn, released in 1996. Real quick, if you're the kind of person who likes to be surprised by movies, maybe go ahead and watch this thing right now without any further info. Rarely does a movie shift this hard, and it'd be a delight to see it unspoiled. But even in this intro, I'm gonna have to talk about what happened, since after all, they included it in the marketing. Okay, still here? Great! From Dusk Till Dawn follows a pair of bank robbers who take a family hostage in order to escape to Mexico. Once there, the movie suddenly turns into a ballsy, bloody vampire flick with a whole lot of kills. From Dusk Till Dawn is a big indie film made by big indie filmmakers, directed by Robert Rodriguez and written by and co-starring Quentin Tarantino. After meeting at a film festival where both their debut features screened, Tarantino and Rodriguez became close friends, bonding over an intense interest in film. They'd collaborate again on 2007's Grindhouse, each directing one of the features of that double bill. Tarantino was at peak power here, coming off a writing Oscar win for Pulp Fiction. He's one of those filmmakers who's kind of a mini-genre unto himself, like Wes Anderson or Tim Burton. There are recurring visuals and themes that make it recognizably Tarantino. Dusk is no different, and has plenty of direct references to his first two films, from specific shots, to specific hamburgers, to specific lines. Okay, Ramblers. Let's get rambling. But Tarantino's only one half of this equation. This is a Robert Rodriguez film, and no one should misattribute his work. We don't need another poltergeist on our hands, know what I mean? Rodriguez was, without question, the director of this film. Although Tarantino did make suggestions from time to time. Of course, I didn't want to do it, even if it worked, so that he couldn't later say, see, I directed the whole movie. <laughs> Rodriguez, who was only 26 at the start of filming, was very hands-on on set. Just like with his previous projects, he'd often take the camera and film shots himself, even if it meant rolling around on a skateboard dolly on his back. He also seemed inseparable from his guitar during the shoot. Dude looks like a filmmaking bard or something. The movie ends up being a mashup in terms of both filmmaker and genre that's largely enjoyable if you're a fan of Tarantino or Rodriguez. If you're not, it can be a little much. I mean, Tarantino plays a weird dude with a foot fetish. What a surprise. It's also a sometimes mean movie with nasty characters, and the same territory as The Devil's Rejects. Hell, the bad guys even harass an innocent family at a motel. But between its memorable performances and great creature effects, there is a lot to love here, and I do love it. Well, our heroes- Hello? Guys, I'm in. It's time. All right, team. Today's sponsor, Manscaped, has mastered the art of superior grooming and hygiene tools for your family jewels. By my estimate, they have 20 million balls in the mix. So we're gonna steal it. The balls? What? No, you can't steal balls. No, I met the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra. Here, I'll, I'll walk you through this again. Um, guys, I'm already. First, there's the Crop Soother and Crop Preserver. The Crop Soother pampers delicate areas with essential moisture and soothing relief. Then the Preserver deodorant gets to work, keeping your funk at bay. Next, there's the Weed Whacker 2.0. It's designed to tackle nose and ear hairs with ease. Not to mention, it's waterproof, cordless, and rechargeable. Got it. Not so fast. Word is he keeps his prized lawnmower 5.0 Ultra somewhere separate. Makes sense. I know. With a trimmer blade sporting wider round teeth to cut through hair with ease, and a foil blade for a sleek finish, this is the performance package's crown jewel. Not to mention, it has a bigger LED light than previous models, USB-C charging, and it's waterproof. Writer Tim, you got that intel on where it is? Yeah, yeah, seems like our Mark, alias the Pantsless, keeps his lawnmower 5.0 guarded by a vicious beast. Vicious beast? I, I don't see any. Oh. Don't worry, I packed you supplies for just this situation. Mission accomplished. You don't need the Crack Dead Meat team to secure your own Performance Package 5.0 Ultra. You can care for your family jewels by going to manscaped.com and using promo code KILLCOUNT20. It'll get you 20% off, free shipping, and two free gifts. All right. Will our heroes be able to live till dawn, or will another one bite the dusk? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins on a dusty road. Texas Ranger Earl McGraw stops at a liquor store to get a stiff drink or 12. He's gonna need them. A nearby bank robbery has left eight people dead, and the perps will be passing through here on their way to the Mexican border. Earl heads to the bathroom, and we see those bank robbers are already here, complete with hostages. Easy to miss on a first-time watch, but you can actually see them when McGraw walks in. These are the Gecko Brothers, smooth criminal Seth and whiny little bro Richie. Seth tells Pete the clerk to be cool, Petey Bunny, but Richie says he saw Pete signal the Ranger. It's a lie, though. This psychopath 
traffic creep just wants an excuse to kill. He proves it when McGraw returns, abruptly executing the ranger by gunshot to the head. God, this twitching is so fucked up. Despite dying here, the character of Earl McGraw would be reprised by actor Michael Parks in Kill Bill Volume 1 and both segments of Grindhouse. A shootout ensues, during which Richie is shot in the hand and the two hostages escape. Before Pete can crawl away, Richie shoots out the booze behind him, and Seth improvises to start a fire and flambe the poor bastard. A dude in a burn suit jumps out and fires off some last shots, but Pete is killed when the brothers pop a cap in his ass, and no cap, pop his corn. I believe it's stunt coordinator Steve Davison doing this fire stunt. It's always fun to watch the people with fire extinguishers rush in, but it's not always fun to see the performers wear face masks of other actors. This shit's gonna haunt my dreams! Outside, Seth scolds Richie for making a mess of things. Low profile. What is the meaning of the word? Profile. As the building burns, the bickering brothers drive off into the sunset, stopping only momentarily for a freeze frame. Haha, <laughs> I got you there. When they get back into motion, a weird x-ray effect shows the bank teller they're keeping in the trunk. What is she, in the car's thought bubble? The geckos get a room at the Tarantino Trunk Shop Motel. Ugh, this poor lady Gloria. Already you're hoping she can find a way to survive these guys. And I mean, Seth? Yeah, sure, maybe, but fucking Richie? I don't like her chances. Seth hopes to use Gloria to get them across the border to a criminal safe haven called the El Rey. He promises her that she'll survive as long as she follows their rules. If you make a noise, Mr. 44 makes a noise. The brother's path of destruction is covered on the news, which has its own kill count going on. They're boosting their numbers with off-screen victims, though. And we don't do that kind of sensationalizing here at Dead Meat. Oh shit, were these two killing people in Springwood's jurisdiction? Cause that's the sax man himself, the late John Saxon, as an FBI agent. We've seen him in Black Christmas and A Nightmare on Elm Street, of course. And though his cameo here is quick, I'm still glad we got a big old face full of sax. Seth has to go tend to some things and unwisely leaves their hostage with his paranoid little bro. Things immediately start to suck for her. You wanna come over on the bed and watch TV with me? Aw, oh, man, the news just told us that Richie is a sex offender. For the love of God, dude, leave this poor woman alone. Take off your shoes. Well, she's either dead or Tarantino's gonna cast her in his next movie. Unfortunately, it's the former. Seth returns from lunch and is disgusted to find that his brother has raped and murdered Gloria while he was away. Richie, what's wrong with you? So very much, dude. Richie says Gloria tried to run away, but Seth knows his brother isn't an honorable thief like he is. This is not me. I am a professional fucking thief. I don't kill people that I don't have to, and I don't fucking rape women. Seth Gecko has killed many innocent people. He's not a good man. He only seems like one compared to his horrendous brother. Also helps that he's played by George Clooney, one of the most handsome men to ever live. Dude's like Cody Rhodes. He can be charming and professional, even with an awful neck tattoo. This was one of Clooney's first major movie roles after having gained fame as a TV actor on ER. Earlier film credits were low budget fare, like Return to Horror High and Return of the Killer Tomatoes. Lots of returning. It's weird to see him on a set before he was an A-list mega star, where he's fucking up his lines and getting frustrated. Fuck. 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 Tarantino suggested Clooney for the role because he was a fan of ER and even went on to direct an episode. Rodriguez gave Clooney lots of close-ups and action scenes because he wanted to make him a movie star, which to his credit is pretty much exactly what happened. I wanted him to come and portray someone who sends people to the ER. With Gloria dead, the brothers need a new hostage or two to get them across the border. Lucky for them, a whole RV of them just pulled up at the motel. This is the Fuller family, Patriarch Jacob and his kids, Scott and Kate. Though it looks like they're on their way to a Jurassic Park convention, they're actually on vacation slash soul searching trip for Jacob. He's an ex-pastor fleeing his flock since his wife's recent death ushered in a crisis of faith. Don't you believe in God anymore? Not enough to be a pastor. The room service at the motel comes courtesy of the Gecko brothers, who take the family at gunpoint while slinging slurs and insults. Oh god, a teenage girl in the swimsuit should not be in the same room as Richie. Seth gives them the same deal he gave Gloria, get them to Mexico and they'll be home free. But of course, Richie's already having waking wet dreams about Kate. Richie, would you do me a favor and eat my pussy for me, please? No, you weirdo, she didn't actually say that. And stop staring at her feet! They head to Mexico, never to make it to their convention. Damn, Jacob was a shoo in for the John Hammond cosplay contest. During the drive, Jacob reveals his wife was killed in a car crash that left her slowly dying for six hours. Seth commiserates in his own special way. Those acts of God really stick it in and break it off, don't they? Yes, they do. 
Jacob was played by Harvey Keitel, who played Mr. White and Wolf in Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. His daughter Kate is played by a 23-year-old Juliette Lewis, who was last seen on the kill count in Ma. Lewis is one of my favorite actors, and nabbed an Oscar nom as an 18-year-old in Cape Fear, which gave her some street cred over the more novice Clooney. No matter what George Clooney says, he was, he was intimidated when he found out he's gonna work with me. The two of them seem to have a nice friendship going on, and she looks like a fun person to have on set. I love this blooper of her doing that fantasy line. Would you do me a favor and eat my pussy for me, please? I'm hamming it up, let me just say. Do one more, I'm just sweating. That fucking coffee is crazy. Prior to this film, Lewis had just appeared in Natural Born Killers, another movie that started life as a Tarantino script. At the checkpoint, Jacob and Scott talk to Border Control while the brothers hide with Kate in the bathroom. A sibling spat nearly blows their cover, but Seth knocks out Richie and Kate covers for them by pretending to be on the pot. Okay, Officer Looky Lou, you can go now! The group gets into Mexico, making Seth very happy. Again, in his own special way. We're fucking in Mexico, you little piece of fucking shit! He directs Jacob to the Rendezvous, a wild and dirty desert oasis known as the Titty Twister. This biker bar has invested heavily in neon lights and pyrotechnics, as well as a hype man standing out front with the curious name of Chet Pussy. Wonder why he's called that. We got white pussy, black pussy, Spanish pussy, yellow pussy. Oh, okay, that makes sense now. We got hot pussy, cold pussy, we got wet pussy, we got smelly pussy. What? Well, I hope you got some gynos on hand too, cause some of that don't sound right. Chet is played by Cheech Marin, one half of the stoner comedy duo Cheech and Chong. Cheech also appeared as the border control guard earlier, and would work with Rodriguez again in Spy Kids. Hopefully not playing Chet Pussy. Seth beats that pussy up to gain entry, with Richie doubling back to kick him while he's down, the little creep. Seth prefers his cheap shots in the form of liquor, so he gathers the group around a bottle of whiskey and gets the kids started young. This bar is a hell of a set, and a hell of a censor job for my editor. My poor editors. The clientele includes tough customers like Frost, who'd rather stack up dominoes than shack up with dancers. Another biker, the aptly named Sex Machine, uses a phallic firearm to scare off KB co founder Greg Nicotero in a cameo. Sex Machine's an effects machine since he's played by Gore Daddy Tom Savini, who would go on to act again for Tarantino and Rodriguez. It's fun to see these two effects artists together, since Savini helped Nicotero break into the business back on Romero's Day of the Dead. This is Greg Nicotero. We've known each other for many, many years. The revelry is interesting interrupted by bartender Razor Charlie, played by Danny Trejo, a four-time Kill Count veteran and Rodriguez regular. Charlie's here to hype up the night's main event. The mistress of the macabre, the epitome of evil, kneel and worship at the feet of Santanico Pandemonium! Santanico and her serpentine sidekick perform a dance, giving us one of the sexiest appearances ever put to celluloid. Savini's gonna have to fabricate himself a new jaw, since his just fell to the floor. Even that other dancer is getting hot watching her, and this is her job! The role of Santanico was originally written for Madonna, but was changed when Rodriguez wanted to incorporate more Latin lore. Tarantino suggested Selma Hayek, based on her dancing in Rodriguez's segment of the anthology film Four Rooms. She had already worked a bunch in Mexico, but had just broken through a in Hollywood the year prior in Rodriguez's Desperado. She was actually terrified of snakes and had to do extensive reptile research and use hypnosis to get comfortable dancing with one. So I had to learn how to go on trance so that I could overcome my biggest fear. So I was on trance when I was doing that dance. It was worth it. Her performance here is legendary. Kim Kardashian dressed up as the character just last Halloween. Does it add anything to the film? I mean, yeah, she's kind of hypnotizing everyone. But in any case, I can tell you exactly why it was written. Yeah, I'm sure Richie's the guy this chick would pick out of the crowd to do this to. God damn it, Quentin. The footsie fun times are cut short when Chet comes back inside to confront the brothers, backed by Razor Charlie and another bouncer named Big Emilio. In the ensuing fight, Charlie widens the hole in Richie's hand but then stands there long enough for Richie to take the knife out and stab him with it? What the fuck? The brothers manage to fight their way out, making sure to do it in Tarantino style. You know, I love early Tarantino as much as the next millennial film bro, but I am glad his later films were a bit more varied. Now, you may have noticed there were no kill graphics during that fight. If you're wondering why, well, get a gander of the green blood on that knife. Turns out this club is run by undead vampires, motherfuckers! Goddamn shit-sucking vampires! And the best thing about them is that their first victim is Richie when Santanico chomps into his neck. Seth manages to shoot her off, but not in time to save his brother, who bleeds out to death. He won't be missed. The bar staff bars the exits, and all hell breaks loose as they turn the crowd into a biker buffet. Dinner is served. 
<laughs> oh, 90s CG, how charming you are. A kill fest breaks out, and I can count seven off the bat as throats are slit, throats are bent, heads are thrown, and corpses are snapped like the bass. Bet those notes are wet. And I'm not sure how that saxophone works, but it looks cool. Frost and Sex Machines successfully fight off their assailants, while Jacob leaves his kids behind the bar and just kind of disappears for a while. What the fuck, dude? Chet finishes up a bar snack he was working on, and then turns his munchies towards the Fuller children. You know what everybody says about me, huh? I suck. Boo! Annoyed by his bad joke, Kate feeds him her cross necklace, causing him to get all gross and spurty. Oh shit, and spew out his eyeballs like a deadite? Fuck yeah! Frost manages to fight off four lady vampires and turns the table on them using a turntable. That's efficient. Bartender Charlie goes all Chewbacca on another patron. He should have let the vampire win. Then he notices Sex Machine nabbing himself a six ball with a pool stick, or rather, more like a pool steak. Wow, nice and tidy little pile he's got going there. Charlie sizes up the competition, but Sex Machine Shindy whips him into shape, sinking a last shot into Charlie's chest. He even calls the shot as the vampire's body melts down. Two eyeballs, corner pockets. Santanico bats Seth around, you know, pun intended, and gives him a dress down dressing down. You'll be my footstool. Oh, sorry lady, you've got the wrong gecko. He shoots the chandelier above her, which impels Santanico and turns her into a not-so-eternal. Wait, a metal chandelier counts as stakes? That doesn't seem right. Jacob returns from wherever he was, just in time to face off against Big Emilio, who's walking around breaking necks like nobody's big. Business. At this point, I'll also go ahead and add the nine dead and dying victims we see in the background here. Frost steps into the fight with a one-liner that wouldn't be as badass coming from a different actor. Yo, monkey man. Anything you got to say to them? Say to me first. Fred Williamson was known as the Hammer from his time playing football. He'd go on to be an icon of 70s black exploitation movies, appearing in films like Black Caesar, That Man Bolt, and Three the Hard Way. Frost goes full Dumb and Dumber dream sequence and rips out Big Emilio's heart, but the move doesn't kill the vampire until Sex Machine turns it into a shish kebab with a number two wooden stake. Our surviving quartet keeps kicking ass. Don't stop them now, they're having such a good time. It's enough. Hey, come on, I said don't stop them now. As the remaining dancer vampires square up with a surviving adults, we see a wide shot that gives us 24 more background bodies to count. This excludes Frost's table toppers, since we already counted them earlier. The boys make quick work of their foes with various headbutts, gunshots, and stakes through the heart. The vampire bodies burn up, and sure, it's weird CG, but at least they leave practical mush on the ground behind. All that's left is the house band, who decide to close their act early. Fuck you, everybody! Good night! And just blow the fuck up. I guess I'll count them as kills? Huh, talk about an explosive finale. When the dust settles, the the only people left standing are Frost, Sex Machine, Seth, and the Fullers. I'm assuming no one managed to get through the locked door, so I'll add 24 more victims to round out these 60 total club patrons that we saw in wide shots earlier. We didn't see them killed, but they were in there, and I'm guessing they're now just kind of, uh, all over the place. The survivors get a moment to breathe, and Seth gets a moment to mourn his younger brother. I love you. Um, why? Don't forget though, this is still a vampire movie. I love you too, sir. Richie's back, but not for long, so don't worry, okay? After a brief hesitation to put his brother on the kill count a second time, we get to see Richie die again when Seth hammers a stake into his chest and gives him heartburn. This movie's effects extravaganza comes courtesy of the legendary K&B effects. The whole film actually originated with an idea from co-founder Robert Kurtzman. He wanted a movie that would promote K&B's work, so he wrote a 24-page treatment that was expanded on by Tarantino, who at the time was still an unknown video clerk. Tarantino wrote the script for only $1,500, in return, k and did the effects on his first feature, Reservoir Dogs, for free. Kurtzman would struggle to make the film for almost a decade until Pulp Fiction's success got studios interested in the project. This crew's not in the clear yet, since a legion of vampire bats has descended on the titty twister. Even worse, the dead patrons have begun to turn as well. One legless vamp gets a hold of Kate before she's saved by a deuce sex machina. What's your name, Billy? Kate, what's yours? Sex machine. Pleased to meet you, Kate. Me too. Another trucker attacks the group, but he's promptly defrosted by a matchbox and a whole lot of fire. The gang sets out to stake the dead bar patrons before they have a chance to rise as vampires. Sex Machine quickly puts down three without any hesitation, but this level of violence is new for Kate. She only finds a resolution when a jump scare jump starts her into action. Man, I love Juliette Lewis's physical comedy here. Awesome work! Great job! Sex Machine gets the short end of the stake though, since as he puts down one more vampire attacker, his arm is bitten in the process. He 
he pulls the classic zombie movie hidey ho and conceals the bite from the rest of the group. For all the on-screen mayhem, From Dust Till Dawn was just as chaotic behind the scenes. The movie had a familial crew who had previously worked with Rodriguez or Tarantino or both. At the same time, conditions were often rough, sometimes shooting in 120 degree weather or for long hours without breaks. I think we worked 18 hours today. And I'm still working on my computer, on time cards to make sure that we're getting five meal penalties plus 50 bucks non-taxable cash. Production did secure health care for everyone though, which people seemed pretty pumped about. Rodriguez's indie filmmaking habits of doing everything himself and employing non-union crew members didn't sit well with the labor union IATSE, especially due to the movie's budget of almost $20 million. IATSE actually posted up outside the set, an old Laurie's warehouse in East LA, to protest the production, forcing Rodriguez's crew to shoot all the interior scenes for the first five weeks. That ended up working in favor for the movie's effects. We couldn't go outside until the strike was over, so we were in there five weeks, so we just kept going, what else can we come up with? <laughs> they were coming up with gags and kills on the spot, with Nicotero running back to the workshop to see what they could do. Judging from deleted scenes, they filmed way more than they could fit in the movie, including a Mortal Kombat fatality looking kill, and one where a guy's decapitated by some thing like tummy teeth. There's an excellent feature length documentary about this movie's chaotic production by filmmaker Sarah Kelly called Full Tilt Boogie. It's a cool look at the filmmaking process and features interviews with all sorts of crew members, from the truck drivers to the crafts services guy, from the second second AD to the assistants to Quentin Tarantino and George Clooney. I hate going to Taco Bell for him. I highly recommend it if you're interested in an in-depth look at what a movie set is like. Everyone regroups to talk vampire killing strategies, which includes fun genre references from genre veterans. All you gotta do is put two sticks together, you gotta cross. Yeah, he's right. Peter Cushing does that all the time. Seth thinks their greatest weapon will be a man of the cloth, so he tries to reactivate Jacob's holiness. Are you a faithless preacher? Or are you a mean motherfucking servant of God? I'm a mean... Servant of God. Only Harvey Keitel can make the censored version sound cooler. Unbeknownst to everyone, Sex Machine is transforming in the background. It's another spot of great physical comedy, this time coming from Savini. By the time he's Looney Tunesing up Frost's shoulders, he's a full-blooded bloodsucker, biting both Frost and Jacob. Aw, oh, son of a bitch! Frost accidentally throws Sex Machine through a window, letting the bats inside as he completes his own transformation, which will put Frost's human form on the count. Seth leads Kate and Scott to a back room, where one vampire narrowly gets to them before he blows its head off. Jacob takes refuge under the bar, where he finds a baseball bat and a boomstick. He fashions them into an impromptu cross and starts a religion Reggie from Phantasm would be eager to join. He deploys the holy firepower against the unholy horde, which looks a little funky since they didn't have enough monster performers for the scene. They had to shoot the same dozen or so against blue screens and comp them all together in post. In any case, the heaven fire works against them, so I'll count the two vampires he shoots down as he makes his way to the back room. Jacob reunites with his kids, but that bite on his arm means he's already dead. The group decides they'll make a last stand together before Jacob turns. And luckily, these vamps have been feasting on shady truckers and biker gangs for years. That gives us this genius plot device of a storage room chock full of contraband. They find all sorts of things during a kick-ass montage. Their Van Helsing arsenal includes a holy water super soaker and a jackhammer turned pneumatic staker. And sure, Kate, you can take a crossbow. Whatever kills these vampires before we get more silly shots like this one of them slowly walking down the hallway. They're looking like the cave dwellers from The Descent here. Before they leave, Jacob makes his kids promise to kill him when he turns, even threatening to do it himself right now if they don't. God damn, God man! In an earlier draft of the script, Jacob gave a speech that was eventually retooled into the Ezekiel monologue from Pulp Fiction. With the children sufficiently traumatized, the group wades into the vampire suit. In the ensuing brawl, the humans score 13 kills using crossbows, cross guns, a jackhammer heart jacker, and a couple of holy water hand grenades. Seth is attacked by a mean lean sex machine, but manages to steal his whip using it to decapitate the bat biker. This machine must run on Energizer though, because it keeps going. Kate finishes him off with her crossbow. Oh, wait a minute, no she doesn't. There's still another stage to this mini boss fight, as Sex Machine's body pulls apart to reveal a nasty looking rat man. It almost takes a bite out of Seth, but he kicks it into a nearby fire, finally decommissioning Sex Machine. But I ain't putting this last version of him on the count, since it was more rodent than humanoid. That nasty master splinter was actually a $40,000 puppet with a remote controlled head and cable controlled limbs. I can't believe they really set it on fire for the death scene. Jacob fights with a fanged frost, stabbing his shotgun straight through him and shooting three vampires straight through him. Hell yeah! 
Jacob gets ready to finish Frost off, but he melts away on his own in the face of such badassery. Sometimes you've just got to impress your foes to death. Jacob gets ready to do more damage, but suddenly the vampires stop attacking him. That's because Jacob's flip-flap to the bad side, putting an end to his human life. Scott notices, but hesitates to shoot his father, allowing Jacob to take a bite out of his son. God man damn it! Scott hits Jacob with holy water. A little late, but it gets him nice and gnarly. I mean, dude's missing half his face now. Then Scott says a prayer. I swear to God in Jesus Christ's name. And blows his father away. Scott's not sticking around for long after his dad goes, since a gaggle of vampires start tucking into him. He begs for Kate to put him out of his misery, and his sister dutifully complies, shooting her brother and triggering a holy hell of an explosion that also takes a bunch of vampires onto the count with it. There's not much time to mourn since Kate and Seth are running low on ammo and family members. Things are looking pretty dire until Seth notices the monsters trying to Mission Impossible their way past beams of sunlight. Kate starts shooting a bunch of holes in the walls since they've finally gone from dusk to dawn. They're aided by the arrival of some off-screen reinforcements, the shady customers who were meant to meet Seth and Richie in the first place. When the incoming sunlight hits a disco ball, the remaining vampires are blown apart in a series of fiery explosions. Seth and Kate narrowly escape the destruction in a stunt that was the first thing they filmed with the titty twister facade. Production designer Cecilia Montiel headed the team that built this thing out in Barstow amidst extreme temperatures. It took them a while to do it, and then it immediately caught fire with the first thing they filmed. No, we weren't supposed to burn the facade now. No. <laughs> Montiel and her team had to rebuild part of it and lean into the now scorched look. We just didn't think there would be this much fire. Oh man, it must have been so frustrating to see them titties on fire like that. Outside, Seth punches their savior in the face. Carlos was his criminal contact at the El Rey and the man who sent him to the titty twister in the first place. You've never been here before. <laughs> no! Carlos is played by Cheech Marin, showing up again, although this third role wasn't actually meant for it. Carlos was originally played by Chip's actor Eric Estrada, but when he dropped out, Rodriguez just put Cheech in again. Seth is downright pissed about the night's events, so Carlos makes it up to him with the currency of the criminal, which is just currency. Seth gives Kate some cash and she offers to tag along with him to the El Rey, but we all know that's a bad idea. Maybe a bastard, but I'm not a fucking bastard. Kate is left to drive home in her family's RV, and the movie ends with a wide shot that reveals the titty twister is the top floor of an ancient Aztec ruin. Talk about a titty twist! How many people were left with fangovers at Mexico's baddiest bar? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh, uh... Fuck you very much! I counted a whopping 145 kills in From Dusk Till Dawn. The victims consisted of one female human, 69 male humans, nice, 21 female vampires, 17 male vampires, and 37 Nosferatu looking vampires of indeterminate gender. That gives us this batshit five wedge pie chart. A five chart! And with a runtime of 108 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 44.69 seconds. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Chet Pussy. I freaking love the effect of him melting and oozing all over the place. There are a lot of big gross kills in this movie. Movie, but none are as sweet as pussies. Dom Machete for Lamest Kill will honestly go to Richie. Dude's the biggest piece of shit in the movie, and he gets got from a single neck bite. And that's it. From Dusk Till Dawn was released in 1996 to mixed reviews and a disappointing box office run. It's since gained cult status and was followed by both a sequel and a prequel, as well as a TV series. Probably shouldn't hold your breath for me to cover them, but until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count for From Dusk Till Dawn. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I really feel like The Kill Count and the channel are hitting a really good stride lately. And because of that, on Sunday, we're gonna have a little video out reminding people that we're back, kinda, even though uh, we haven't really been gone. But I see people on like TikTok and other places think that I never came back from my break from like a year ago. So yeah, Sunday, there will be a video detailing everything we've been up to and everything we've got coming up. That'll be in place of the They Talk finale. That thing has become way too much work for Zorn to get done in the time he has. So the They Talk Halloween 2 episode will be out at uh, some point in the future. Otherwise, we're sticking to our planned Sunday schedule of having the Dead Meat Horror Awards come out on Sunday, March 3rd, followed by our brand new series, Production Tales from Hell, hosted by Chauncey K. Robinson. There will be five episodes of those coming out every Sunday starting on March 10th. Even if the views, uh, oddly, don't reflect it, I'm really proud of what we've been doing lately. So let me know in the comments if you are too. And if you have thoughts or opinions on what we should be doing different, let me know that too. Always down to hear your feedback. Back. Thanks everyone. Be good people.